welcome back to another Saturday. Now, given what the hell has been going on the last few hours, I don't really expect anybody to come by, stop by, stop in, be by, say hello, have a beer with me, and stick around for the entire night. Damn, that was a mouthful, wasn't it? Anyhow, I am here. It's Saturday. I got my hibiscus tea, my uh, Rito's Lime Pop, which of course is absolutely looking clear, right? Yeah, completely messed right up because it is lime. So that's how that goes, being that it's a lime pop. We're going to get to it. And I got to tell you, I do have my laptop over here and I got something else on that screen because I got to tell you, I got to sit back. And when I see one group of idiots want to blow up another group of idiots who are then going to respond back to that other group of idiots, I kind of got to pay attention no matter what I'm doing or what's going on around here. Now, when it comes to that, like, I'm not a big fan of bullshit, but you got to pay attention sometimes, right? But I tell you, hold one sec because I am going to be right here always. Just going to reach up, do this over here. There we go. A little better, a little brighter. See what it's like. Absolutely. I still seem like I'm a little on the too bright side. It looks like I glow. Hey, this this white man is super Caucasian. So let's see what we can do here to mess around with this a little bit. How'd that be? Maybe that is better. I'll take that for now and we will see where we go. Now, it is a wild time. It is an absolute wild time. I don't expect that things are going to get any calmer, any easier, anything like that. Well, I'm going to start by saying I am looking forward to next week for sure. Because I am going to have it set. So I'll be able to invite somebody to come on here and you can chat with me if you want to. And it is hanging just Fine, Robert, how are you this evening? I got to tell you, I was a popping and a lopping when I first come on and had to admit that got the laptop off watching some other crap because, you know, got to pay attention, a little bit of attention to what's going on because I just, as much as I try, I can't stay as ignorant as I would like, you know, it just doesn't work for me. But got my tea, got my lime pop, which is definitely showing up messed up on the screen. But, you know, and how did your week go? Another week survived. Didn't didn't get all completely strung out by all the kids at the school and all the stuff you had to do. <laughs> Damn right. It's another Gen X day in a paradise. They need to take that attitude with more stuff, I think, you know. Enjoy it. Just chip back and relax. I was going to tell everybody that, you know, when they seen what was going on today in the world, that that's it, I had enough. This Gen X said, that's it, reset, and I hit the big red button. But I don't think many people are going to find the humor in it. Because, quite honestly, that's how we look at these types of things. you got to have a lot of fun. Oh, oh. Tests. It's test time, is it? Are these them damn standardized ones to see where everybody's at so they can allocate the funds for the next year? Or is this just the basic standardized test to see who's going to pass, who's not? I mean, do they even hold people back anymore? Like, if you have somebody that is failing so bad, can you actually fail them and hold them back? Or does everybody get to automatically move forward these days? And I remember kids getting held back in kindergarten even, you know. Well, they're not ready to move forward yet. They got to stay back and have another year of playtime. Oh, 
I never liked this, the mandated standardized testing. Usually because they always came with them stupid answer sheets with the damn ovals. And if you didn't fill it out right or mark it right and get your number two pencil, kids, it is time to take a test. I'm sure some of it has changed in the meantime, that it's not all as bad as I remember, or maybe it's even worse now. It, it's hard to tell. It could be a lot worse. It could be better. It could be horrifically worse. I don't know. It, it's hard to tell with these things, right? Could be worse. Could be better. I'm actually guessing it's probably worse. Because I'm guessing kids really don't want to take the test now. I didn't like taking them. I hated them. If you did too well, I mean, I remember when I took them, if you did too well, they wanted to like jump you a grade, move you ahead. I mean, as it was, I was already a year younger or a little more than a year younger than everybody else. And then, uh, <laughs> Oh, is that the way it is? The only difference, eh? Digital versus analog, same nonsense, same shit. My God. You think they would have come up with something new by now? Like all that time, you would have think they'd come up with something new by now. That was something I was thinking about. Okay, you remember this when we were when we were younger and the computers were coming and they were saying that, you know, the computers are great. We are going to be a paperless society in about 15 years. Nobody's going to have to print things and they're going to be a paperless society. But yet when the printers came along, you used 10 times more paper because everybody started printing emails and you had to print multiple copies and you had to print everything that was sent. And it, it was absolutely insane. <laughs> I shut the hell up. You have to take four tests. I have to give 32. Yeah, I, I can see your point on that one. Damn right. Shut up, kid. I got way too many tests to give. I'm not going to sit there and do it. Man, I really should have uh, ate a little earlier. Really bloated. Looks like I'm about in my ninth month here about to bust a baby. Let that belly roll. Feeling a little super bloated today. Bloody hell. Got thrown off my game when I go to turn on the computer and they're like, missiles in the air. I'm like, okay. And it's not hitting my backyard. Not really a whole lot of my concern. And then I would sit there and I was just for fun. I was going to sit there and I was going to do the intro and I was going to sit there and see if I could sneak in the theme for Coast to Coast with Art Bell just for a little like boom, boom, get them, get them synapses fired on the memory. Because eh? that's almost what it should be like. It should be a lot darker in here and the only light is just like barely a glow around me. Do it kind of like the creepy Coast to Coast, the Gen X, tell the stories, the things we used to do. All the nonsense we used to get into. Oh, I see. My, I, I bet. I bet. And I can see it from that side app with all the shit that goes on. See, I can see things from different sides. I can understand where someone sees something from. You know, it, it becomes such a whole oh, crap. I'm going to see if I can without getting tagged on it so they delete the sound. Either that or they'll just say, no monetization for the video after the it's up after going live and whatever little ad revenue it makes will actually go to the copyright holder of the theme. That's what happened with another video. So somebody made a whole like 27 cents off me. Good for them. I hope it was worth it. Two hours of talking for 25 cents, 27 cents. Thank God I make more than that sitting on the corner as a bum yelling, you know, that the end is near. The end is near. But can't do that. I'm going to see if I can. I did find the whole list of every piece of music that he used to use for bumpers just when he would do his commercial or ad or bump into another segment. And I'm looking at 
lining all that up. I found it all about a couple hours before going on live here. Because I'd, I'd like to have that set, have that, have a little fun with it, you know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Pressed you earlier. No emotion. If you were president, what would you have the U.S. do? That's always a loaded question when someone asks that, isn't it? Because then you really should then take into account more than just your personal perspective on something. That, that's, that's the way I see it, no matter how you feel about something. If that's the case, you have to take more of a personal perspective. You know, I mean, the otherwise, it ain't going to happen. All I can say is I don't think it's any problem that's going to be solved in any time that I'm ever going to witness. That's for darn sure. <laughs> Ronald. Oh, man, I couldn't believe that there were people the solar eclipse. And you know what I even got more is uh, <laughs> I, I don't watch the view, but I, I catch the. Uh, <laughs> hey, Aquarium, doing great, man. My Saturday is awesome. I don't watch the viewer things like that, but I tell you, I catch the clips of the show sometimes just because the stuff that they, it's like, take a bunch of people I've never seen or experienced anything or don't know what they're talking about and let them just have a yak, like when you're around a kitchen table. But you sit there, and when I saw that on the view that, that Sonny Halston was trying to say that they're blaming the solar eclipse on climate change. I mean, that's that's it. That's you're You're done. If you're actually trying to say you know, geez, we're going to go back to the Aztecs and we're going to build a pyramid and it's going to be a solar eclipse and let's tear the hearts out of about 40,000 people, right? I mean, that, that's, that's how ridiculous that was. That was crazy. Now, I may have messed it up as whether it was the, the Aztecs or the other ones at the time that did it, but yeah, we survived the eclipse. We survived Y2K, which is now apparently a fashion trend when you mention it. I was told to ask, so I asked my daughter, what's Y2K? And she said, it's a fashion. I'm like, a fashion? No, no, that's when the computers were going to blow up the world. Because somebody forgot to make them go past the year 1999. What a slight oversight that was. Well, we survived. I, I would have to say the solar eclipse was my fourth, fifth apocalypse. That didn't happen. Oh. Oh, you took him out to see it? Did you get... Now, okay, when you, where you were, Robert, there, when you're out there in, in the old New Mexico desert, did you get to see the whole thing? Did you get a full, full coverage? Because I... I didn't, in fact, didn't get to see much of anything because wound up with cloud cover where I am. So that kind of like shot that. It was, it was a waste, big time waste. Oh, hell, 85% is even good. Jay Stevens, good day, sir. Yes, it is. My hibiscus tea and my absolutely... Green Haritos Lime Mexican Soda, which does not show because it is sitting there. You're darn right. <laughs> that's, uh, that's my assortment of goodies. I always forget because then I, I pop this thing behind me now instead of having these ugly beige walls with all sorts of tack holes in them, right, from when I was hanging an actual thing behind me instead but now this doesn't show up i sat down the one time to try and wear a hat but it happened to be a green hat and said couldn't see the hat on my head but just the logo floating above me like i had my own little halo it was pretty wild but i love this stuff i love this haritos lime put that over there and then it's out of the way No, this is all wild. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see. Yeah, 2000, 2012, so on. 
Oh, a lot of us had chicken pox. Yeah, and you'd still watch the damn eclipse. I never got the pox, never had them. Yes, I remember Haley's Comet. And it did not bring the end of the world. In fact, I don't even think then if I remember hearing anything about Haley's Comet bringing about the end of the world. But you never know. Hell, I'm still waiting for uh, Nibiru to come around again, you know, the lost planet in the solar system on the giant eclipse that goes around that they keep saying when it comes around, the aliens pop down and visit. We're waiting on that one. They've been promising that one for a while. I don't know. Oh, 59. <laughs> so then you're feeling relaxed there, Robert. That's right, the, the planet, the Gen X planet. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to take a look at that, Jay. I, I, I wouldn't know. I can never remember who played what back when we were, we were kids. Although I will say this, I was just, when you talk about that, about the 80s, I was just reading an article. They did another uh, interview with Michael J. Fox because one of the universe, some university was giving him a degree. It has to do with him fighting all the Parkinson's and stuff. And you know, he was doing the, the interview with People Magazine. They said, it, this is special because you're not only famous, but you're 80s famous. And, and how is it different then compared to now? And he said, well, back then you actually had to have talent. I thought that was great. That was, talk about a, a Gen X coming down with a burn on everybody else that is out there trying to be famous doing nothing now. Where he said, well, back in my day to be famous, you had to have talent. Oh, I had Christina Applegate posters on my wall. Uh, same with, what's her name, Christy Swanson. I had her on my wall. I had, uh, oh, dun, 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 dun. bloody hell, I had so many. They were, they were absolutely crazy. They, they need... What was I going to say? Lost my train of thought. I'm looking at too much crap in front of me here. Oh. Because it was cheap. They probably, Jason, they probably had the best tax breaks at the time. So it was easy. Well, how can you say no to the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders? That's how, what's her name, got her start. Uh, Paul Abdul. She was a choreographer for the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders and then was a choreographer for Janet Jackson. And then they turned out she could sing. And then she started doing her own stuff. Oh, Samantha Fox. Don't, don't even get going. This is... Every, everybody's going to be drooling over their old teenage crushes here. It's going to be wild. <laughs> no, I think a lot of them, Jason, and again, I think a lot of them were done in Chicago because of the fact that it was probably at the time one of the cheapest places to make the movies. It, it was easy to do. They, they probably begged them to do there, make them all in Chicago. I mean, it's it'd be easier, cheap, on location. I mean, now they make all sorts of crap everywhere. Cheryl Teagues, man, oh man, Robert, you got a steel trap for a memory, I swear, that or uh, you, you just can't, you're, you're at that point like the rest of us hit where you get locked in if you're not actually doing like at work, you're just reliving the old days because that's what you remember best. Paul Abdul was a decent crush to have. The only problem I had with Paul Abdul is when I was in school and I took drama. I had a drama class that I took. I actually liked doing it. But they sat there and they brought in choreographers that made us learn the dance steps from every single one of Paul Abdul's videos. 
and that wasn't my my whole thing but sitting there doing the whole grab and the kickball chain and I had to do all that stuff and i'm like six four two fifty dude and i was a big teenager too is sitting there doing all that nonsense it just wasn't my thing got a lot of call being called twinkle toes walking through the hallways of school after those classes but they were fun and entertaining boom boom boom, boom. oh yeah <laughs> absolutely she was as I like to say she was a smoke show no I don't think people are as happy because I don't think people are actually doing anything you're not engaged when you get the technology you know <laughs> well then I dare say Robert you were a very lucky man Hope you know. But I'm going to say here, when it comes to people advancement te te technology, yeah, people are not as happy, I don't think. Hell, it was supposed to make you more connected. People are less connected now than we are today. In fact, the big one that bothers me now today compared to when I was younger, now it could be a little different for everybody. But I mean, there's nobody... I, I see now and you see people and they're like, oh, they're my friend. They're my best friend. I know them so well. Well, how long have you known them? Oh, for just over a year. Well, no, my good friends I've known for 40 years. I don't take some, but I've known a year and be like, they're, we're, we're, we're super tight. No, you, you get along and be buddies, but holy hell, you know? Oh, I, I see. You're, you're one of them guys like the rest of us that tried. You found them young and pretty and dumb and you took advantage. Well, they were dumb before they realized that, <laughs> that maybe we were a little dumpier than we should have been. But you, we made them love us and that's the way it is. <laughs> hey, no problem, Aquarium. That's how I felt when I watched it. I felt like I was sitting there and it was viewing a Kevin Smith written video that it just wasn't quite John Hughes. John Hughes was always a little milder. You know, that, that just a little bit. Absolutely. I, I see now that, the, what is it with the social media and all this, that the younger kids like the Gen Z, they're starting to get like apps to teach them where to go in order to meet people. How about going out? Did I remember when you moved to a new town, not only that, but I don't know if they have many more, but people like, oh, I'm not so good about being out in public. So you would go to like, uh, what was it? Uh, Toastmasters or whatever. And you would learn public speaking and all that, just a group to get together. You move somewhere new. They would have a local like welcome wagon thing where they would tell you all about the new area and the people and, and the things you can do and the groups are go bowling do something just sign up for the regular uh softball league or a mixed softball league you know where you spend most of your time actually standing around drinking beer instead of actually playing the game because that's how you got out and met people and had fun you know it's it's crazy jay i will uh I promise I will do that. I will watch it because I got a kick out of seeing uh, Michael J. Fox say the difference between being famous now and be, you know, when people only want to do a dance step or two and think they're famous and being famous in the eighties meant you actually had to have talent back then and you had to work for it. So I'd be interested to see what uh, Mr. Bacon has to say about it. It would be something. <laughs> Really? Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Ah. Come on, you got to enjoy that. That is a great movie. It, it's synonymous of our time, like a ditching school day. They were great. You actually did a lot of things. You didn't just ditch school and go sit behind the shed at somebody's place and smoke pot all day. Well, some people did, but not not everybody. You know, are they really, you know, 
I, I'm not surprised. I mean, they they tear a lot of all that stuff down. I mean, look, they tore down the mall that uh, what you might call it was filmed in. Oh hell, with Jeff Spicoli and all that. Great. Now I lost that one. Past times at Ridgemont High. I mean, they tore the mall down where they shot all them scenes, but they tore that down ages ago. It was already scheduled, I think, to be shut down when they first filmed that. Which wasn't a good thing. Damn glasses keep sliding off my face. It's still on one of my favorites now. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Now, I, I do remember that they made it a series for a little while. Who remembers that? That they made it a series. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I seem to remember it being a series. That they tried to capitalize on the movie and stuff later on and they didn't. Yes, classic Gen X. My bottle opener. Standard Bic lighter. Can't have anything else. They're reliable. They don't break. And I've never had one explode in my hand when opening a bottle. Oh, it is time. I'm dreading to have to be climbing on roofs again here this summer. Mm -mm. What was that? Director's extended cut edition of the Breakfast Clubs. Hughes edited. Oh. I'll be damned. That'd be interesting. I know that there were lots of scripts that Hughes wrote that movies had never got made and people have wanted to make them, but Hughes Estate won't. You know, but we will see. I'd watch that too. I'd want to see what he come up with for a uh, an extended version. Do it on, rock it on, an extended version of that. It makes you wonder if he has all of them. You imagine if he was doing them movies today that he would have actually made them connected. I mean, they were his own universe because all the movies of his took place in the same town, like Breakfast Club, uh, 16 Candles, Pretty in Pink. It, you know, they were all in the same town. They all took place in uh, in Shermer, Illinois, right? They. That's where... Kevin Smith came up with all his stuff for when he made all his View Askew movies like Mall Rats and Dogma and, and the Clerks movies and all that stuff was because he was the massive John Hughes fan and wanted to make everything where they all went together and worked together and stayed together. I, I'm going to have to see if I can find a copy of that now. Director's Cut. It's going to be nothing better, I tell you. At all. Looking forward to next week. I keep working on more stuff and more stuff, and I keep screwing it up. Like, I recorded a 30 minute video today, and then when I was done and I loaded it up to go and try and edit it, I realized I didn't have the microphone plugged in. So there was no sound the entire time. So I had to do it again. And so I had to just kind of switch it up because I was so annoyed with myself at what I'd just done. So I had to pick up the pace and, and kind of bang it out again. And I was so mad. I was so ticked off at myself for getting it messed up like that. Oh, oh. Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, that... That was... Some, okay. Ronald, it's... it's. Um, 
interesting you, you can mention that because I was looking at um, the heroes that people had back in the day, right? People now, they got their celebrity heroes and it's like, you got all the people that are big, there's Taylor Swift fans, celebrity hero, all these people, celebrity hero. Back in our day, Gen X kids, our celebrity heroes were Freddy Krueger, Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees. <laughs> these were our heroes back in the day, right? They were, they were horrible. You know, you know, I would like to see them do a version of that. You, you'd need somebody to try. You can't do that on television. I mean, that was great. You, you know, I like that show, but I don't think they would be able to do that today. And I think the biggest part they would have when I remember watching it is them always threatening to execute the kids. Or feeding dead or feeding dead people or the, the cook collecting vomit in order to feed it in the burgers, you know. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what I remember through that, that show. That, that was just bad. And yeah, they probably could never show that today. You couldn't be shooting kids on TV. Barf burgers, absolutely. I mean, that was the cook's name, or actually it was Barth, wasn't it? B-A-R-T-H. But they would say it so it sounded like Barth when they were always in the diner. And they'd be like, what do you think's in the burgers? He'd be like, oh, I heard that. And don't ever say the words, I don't know. That would be interesting. Just have a regular game show that nobody knows about when they're answering questions. Like take uh, Jeopardy. Now that, you know, they're doing the different hosting. Now you do Jeopardy. And whenever they get the question wrong, dump a bucket of green slime on them. That would be fantastic. There you go. That make, make Jeopardy interesting again. Every time they get it wrong. You dump a bucket of green slime on them. <laughs> I, I, I'd start watching it again. I used to watch Jeopardy all the time. It was like playing any other game where you're asking questions and answering questions and doing your thing. And I, you know, that's right. Make Jeopardy great again. Absolutely. Slime them when they get the question wrong. Because there, there was that one uh, actual British game show that I watched that I, I liked and I watched it. And when they did like the quick question answer round on the show, they would make them wear the dog shock collar. So whenever they went to answer the question, it would shock them. And then when it came to the last two contestants and the main guy won and he would win a car. They would answer, he would have to answer four more questions and the car is his already. But every time he got a question wrong, the guy that he beat got to have three seconds to smash his car or slice up the interior with a knife. So if you got the last four questions wrong, your car could be literally totaled by the time you get to claim it as your prize to take home. I will give it up to this, man. When it comes to like game shows. The, the Brits know how to make it torturous. So even when you win, you're mad and you feel like you lost. I'll, I'll give them that. You do something like that here and then the contestant would probably end up suing because you damaged his prize. People get too sue happy. No more suing over nonsense. You got a problem? Take it out back. Step into the ring. Let's go talk in the locker room for a second where nobody can see and finish it. <laughs> uh, aquarium i do not remember hammer house of whores at all i don't remember there's a lot then that i i don't remember i had quite the time period where i had no tv shit there was uh 
a three, three year period growing up, didn't even have a TV in the house. All we did was uh, read books and play chess and play cards. And that, that was it. Go to town once every three weeks. So we would just be out the property, no TV, read books, hike, play chess, and play cards. And that was it. Pretty quiet. I didn't really adventure and do a whole lot of interesting stuff until, you know, I got older. And it was, go forth, my son, head west and find your fortune. I do remember the name of that show, Too Close for Comfort, but I can't remember it a whole lot. One show I really loved was I used to love watching Moonlighting just to see them get mad at each other and walk off and slam the office doors side by side. But there was so much good stuff, but a lot of it was actually crap and it still is crap, but we remember it as being good. You know, just because we're now remembering it, we look back and we're like, oh, that was amazing. That was fantastic. You know, you know, and well, family ties. I mean, how could you not? You, you know, you had uh, Alex, Mallory, what was it? Stephanie, the parents, Mallory's boyfriend, Nick, uh, everybody, which I think he was basically doing a very bad imitation of Stallone when he talked. You, you know, haha, <laughs> Sanford and Son. <laughs> Sanford and Son, man, he he had he had a heart attack six times a day. I swear to God, he was always the big one. I'm coming, uh, I'm coming. Every time he got mad at somebody or didn't like what anybody was saying, I'm coming, I'm coming. It's the big one. Like that show, you couldn't do them anymore. Nobody could do any of them anymore. They get mad or they would say it's too stereotypical or, you you know, you can't have the stereotype tropes going on no more. I don't know if I remember that one. I don't know about Ma uh, Madam's Place, but I do remember Mama's Place. <laughs> oh, yes, always had a thing for Sybil. I mean... Absolutely. Did for a long time, even after. She made some good movies back then, too. But they just don't, uh, they don't do that stuff like that anymore. It's not, it's not the same. You can't even get good movies now, mostly. Like, I'm going to say this when it comes to movies. I don't know who here has seen them. But I did finally, I waited until the second one come out and I watched both of the new Dunes, part one and part two. And I have a very unpopular opinion. And that is, I didn't like them. I just didn't feel it. It felt drawn out. It, it, it felt like it was letting me down. You know, and I, I've seen every iteration of Dune that's been made. And I have the unpopular opinion that it just wasn't any good. I did not like it. But I will say this. It was still a thousand times better than that monstrosity rebel moon that they put out on Netflix. It was, uh, I wasn't, I, I just was, it wasn't into it. I thought it was, you know, they really stretched it out, stretched it out. And then they went too quick. I, it wasn't for me. Maybe if I haven't seen every other version they'd ever made of it and, and the books and that everybody touted how great it was. I was expecting more. 
Maybe that was my problem. I listened to people talk about how great it was. But I think the only thing people were screaming about how great it was and the only real difference was because the special effects were so much better, you could believe they were actually on the planet, you know. <laughs> you just watched Rebel Moon. <laughs> did, did you watch it like, like I did, Robert? You were watching it and it was going on and you're like, what the hell are they doing that for? Well, there's no point in that. They should have done it this way. Like, this is a bad story. This is horrible. Why is that character even there doing this? It's not time for that yet. Like, it was just, you know, me and the woman were watching it, and half the time we're looking at each other, and we're like, what the hell is going on next? Ah, uh, a Christmas story. Absolutely. Great movie. Will always be a classic. And then after all them years, they gathered up the original actors and they made a sequel. Which I did not watch. And I probably will. When they gather, when they go and do a, an actual sequel years later, I don't mind that when they take something and they bring back all the original actors in the movies that we like as kids who were, say, kids then and now they're adults and you're seeing it. It can be good. Right? Not always. I mean, they really blew it when they made the movie Vacation. That was supposed to be the whole National Lampoon's Vacation stuff. And then they made that Vacation version, which was then supposed to be Rusty going, taking his family off to Wally World to relive his childhood. That was a bit of a snore fest. You know. But couldn't couldn't do that. No way. Uh, dog was going ballistic in the other room, grumping away. I can hear her through the wall. Kid's room is right next door to my office, and I can hear the dog in there. <laughs> Trying to keep her quiet, but it doesn't happen. What do you think? Best Christmas movie period? It could be. It could be for 80s, early 90s. Well, unless you get into the, you know, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, but that, that was 90s, wasn't it? Come on, because that is classic. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. That's right up there, too. Oh. Now, now, Die Hard. See, Die Hard's not just a Christmas movie, but Die Hard 2 is also a Christmas movie. Because Die Hard is on Christmas Day, and Die Hard 2 is Christmas Eve at the airport. So they're both Christmas movies. And supposed to be like a year apart. So it's, it's, a, it's a double whammy. It's too bad that they didn't capitalize that when they made the very last one. And they should have actually done it on Christmas. And actually had the whole thing revolve around in, in a Christmas theme just to play on that whole bit because you know Bruce Willis was always kind of annoyed when people be like it's a Christmas movie <laughs> Ronald yes it was the true start of act Christmas action movies okay Jay I have a bone to pick about the aliens movie with Sigourney Weaver okay Aliens was great. Alien was great and Aliens was great. The third one, horrible. The fourth one, eh, not so bad. But the first two were, were great. The problem I had, okay, my mother took me to the theater to see Aliens. And she was about seven and a half months pregnant with my sister at the time, somewhere in there. I think I was about nine years old. 
So we watch this movie. We get home. And I swear to God, I did not sleep for like three days because I kept waiting for some alien creature to bust out of her stomach. You know, I was nine. I didn't really tell the difference between busting out of the chest or busting out of the stomach. Right? But, so, I liked the movie. Terrified me as a kid. Gave me nightmares for a long time. But I like a movie that can actually spook me. Feel creeped out at the end when you watch it. You know. Yeah, when they ended up tying the Alien and Predator movies together and they did it in a subtle way and it worked. Predator movies got goofy though. And and I didn't like that. They keep doing it and it kept getting stranger. You know, like same with they did the the last one. Uh what was it? Prey or whatever, when the the predator is uh taking on the 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 Indian tribe. And that I didn't I didn't buy. You would think if they were supposed to go and prove themselves and hunt those that are the most dangerous, that if it was they were hunting something that was a formidable warrior but was primitive, that they themselves would use matching primitive weapons. Otherwise, what's the point? I mean, if you're in a super advanced alien race that got this laser thing and you're going to go with somebody that still has a bow and arrow, a spear, and a sling that shoots rocks, I don't care how dangerous you think the person is. It's not a challenge. Right? It's like sitting there and going, I'm going to fight you and you're barehanded, but I'm going to stand back here and, you know, I'm going to have my desert eagle and I'm going to drop you before you can take one step forward. What's the point? To kind of ruin that. I did love the one with Schwarzenegger. That was good. And I actually did not mind the one that took place in uh, Antarctica uh, with what's her name there. Uh, I thought that one was good too. And it wasn't so bad. I mean, even when they went to their own hunting planet, the moon that they dropped everybody on. You know. But when they get into the whole primitive thing, I didn't buy it. But it was a decent movie, but it just wasn't... Uh, wasn't my cup of tea. This is my cup of tea. Great stuff, I tell you. I love it. You want to know what I think is also good movies when we were kids and I loved. Okay. I like a lot of people. I like the Footless movie because everybody had some sort of dance they could do to that goofy-ass song. And then, of course, there was the whole Adventures in Babysitting. Oh, oh. Oh, what do we got here, Aquarium? Masses Nirvana Exposition. Oh, really? Very nice. That sounds like that was something pretty, pretty cool to see. That, that, that sounds actually pretty epic. Getting to go see that. Don't get to go see those things so much no more. Shit, I can't even remember the last time I've been to see a, a concert, a live band. I think the li last live concert I went to was... We're talking absolutely, holy shit, uh, 14 years ago? I went to Skid Row. <laughs> Misfits shirt. Is it Misfits with Glenn Danzig or post Glenn Danzig? Robert, I got to tell you, the misfits were awesome.
Yeah. T turning Mountain Dew into alcohol. People turn anything into... With Danzig, there you go. See, that is... Uh, original Misfits, that's the best right there. God, I've seen them so many times. So many times because they would go everywhere and they would play at like every university or every little place they went by. Misfits would play and they were easy to see and they were cheap to see because, man, it was nothing like going to a cheap ass punk show if you want good music and a good time. I've uh, seen them many times. You know, one of my favorites is, uh, I think I've seen Alice Cooper like seven times. I think the last time was in 98. Boy, that's going back a ways, huh? Oh, punk absolutely does. The good stuff. You got what they've always been like the, the fake punk, or as we used to call people, posers. Right? I can still spot a poser from 100 miles away. But I don't use the word poser anymore. I now call them tryhards. Somebody that tries too hard to be something. Like when the new kid would come and you were in school and the new kid would come and he would try way too hard to be the cool new kid. You know? <laughs> Play golf with Cooper. No idea who he was. Yeah, that man does like his golf, doesn't he? That that would be that would be epic. Now that would be uh Oh, excuse me, and then you get mentioning the golf, and of course then they bring up the Caddyshack movie. The Caddyshack movies absolutely are great. In, in fact, it was watching uh, the other night, watched um, uh, Leslie Nielsen's Repossessed, which is like the comedy spoof on a sequel to The Exorcist. But they even have uh, Linda Blair play the, the girl grown up now and being possessed. And of course, it's it's that slapstick Leslie Nielsen naked gun, you, you know, airplane style comedy. And it's great. And I don't think anybody could uh, would get that type of comedy today. You, you know, you, you get watching that type of comedy, and I don't think people would uh, would understand it today or even like it, or they would somehow find it like everything else that would be offensive and wrong. But... You get a chance to see Billy Idol again. He's touring again. He's still going. Billy Idol, the man that was way ahead of his time. Like when he came out with his, what was it, his cyberpunk album, and everybody, they thought that was crazy and that was too much. And then, like 10, 15 years later, everybody was doing that type of punk music. First rated R movie, Saturday Night Fever, Stripes, third, Caddyshack. Oh. Yeah, Airplane is close. If not, if it is not the funniest, it is absolutely tied with the funniest comedy movie of all time. But they would never be able to do it today. There's just no way. People would get so upset. They, they wouldn't there. They made jokes in there and there were things in there that they just could not do today. And that I don't think anybody would actually write in and allow. Yeah, you know, and but it would, I wouldn't mind seeing somebody trying to squeeze that stuff by. I, I want to see somebody challenge the comedy norms again and come up with that type of stuff. You know, that, that Leslie Nielsen, he knew his stuff. Well, Smokey and the Bandit was the first. Maybe. 
I think it was the first. It could have been. Here, here's one for you. Do you know what the first ever PG-13 movie was? Because you got to remember, before they only had R-rated and G-rated. They did not have that uh, PG-13 rating until a particular movie came out and it was originally rated R. And then the director fought with the studio and with the censors in order to come up with a new rating. So he, yes, Red Dawn, Robert Way. Very well. I got to ask, did you know that or did you look it up quickly? Or did you just know that as common Gen X movie knowledge? Because, huh. yeah, the first ever PG-13 movie. See, the cool movies when we were young made the, did the breakout. Red Dawn, the first PG-13 movie. Uh, Top Gun was the first movie ever specifically recorded in stereo. So it's the first movie ever. When you watch it, you got this actual stereo system. You can hear the footsteps when they're walking across the aircraft carrier. Go across your living room through your speakers. Oh, yeah. The original Red Dawn was great. It's another one where they made the sequel and they screwed it up. And the big part they screwed up in the sequel was they had to make the brothers fight. They had to create drama with the brothers. And I think what made the first one so great was the fact that no matter what they did, them two brothers stood by each other. No matter what. In fact, in the, the one line they do is he's like, whatever you decide, Jeb, make it count. I'm your brother. Right? So. And they go and they have to room. They have to put all this extra crap in that everybody wants today. This backroom drama fighting in all these movies. Like they're watching the conniving people on a backstab on reality TV shows in a, in a movie that was great. It's a movie that shouldn't have been touched. They should have left it alone. I mean, it was a great movie made for a specific time. You know, did not like the, Goonies was absolutely great too. So many of us and so many still get them. The shirts that like Goonies forever or uh, Goonies never say die. That's what it is. Here's one that a lot of people don't pick out. The movie I loved and I thought was great and I thoroughly enjoyed and I watched it the first time I ever got it. We rented the movie because we also had to rent the VCR at the time because we could not afford to buy one because they were like $800. Was Short Circuit, the first Short Circuit movie. Watched that, got it home, and the next day I think I watched it like five times in a row. That's another great movie and, and a classic movie. The only difference now is when I watch that movie and they talk about the, the thing that gets me the most now is when I go back and you watch that movie and they talk about the computing power inside the robots. And then you got the computing power that we have inside our phones today. And you could power about 10,000 Johnny Fives with what's in your phone, you know? They were, they were, they were, it was, I liked it. I thought it was a great movie. I thought it was fun. I've always wanted one. I know there are guys out there that build absolute full-size replicas. And now with like the, uh, the voice mimicking you can do and with the idea of programming an AI now, I mean, man, if I had the money, I'd have somebody actually build me a Johnny Five. And I'd have a stand-up platform on the back, and that would be my way of getting around. No Segway, no car. I'd be riding my Johnny Five. You know, Aquarium, I have to agree. Leslie Nielsen was a master. He could teach a master class in true slapstick comedy. 
Like, I swear half of what he did is he probably spent hours and hours watching Abbott and Costello and Stooges and, oh, now I lost the, they're the brothers that made all them goofy comedy movies, you know, the glasses, the mustache. Uh, the one had the horn and never talked. Oh, geez, there were like seven of them. They made a whole bunch of movies together. Well, that's it. Can't remember him. That's it, Robert. Thank you very much, the Marx Brothers. <sighs> yes. I, I swear the comedy genius of like the the guys that wrote the great comedy of the 70s and the early 80s and stuff all watched that stuff and learned from those masters and carried it forward. And we need people willing to do that now and create some actual good product and some good content. And you'd think somebody would try, especially even with the streaming services that are out there, you could get away because being the streaming services, it allows you to bypass network sensors and all that stuff for what you're going to make. So I don't know why somebody doesn't try it now. See if they see if they can't make it work. See if they can't get it to go and and be another great comedy like it used to be. But then again, maybe not. Maybe they're just gonna do some crap. Oh yeah. Jason, I know he he actually didn't want to do comedy. He wanted to do serious roles, and then they had him do comedy, and he was good at it, and he liked it, and that's what he went with. And that happens with with people. Some of the best uh, comedians out there, like when it comes into movies and TV show comedy, were actually like classically trained trained actors for theater. They were trained for classical theater. And yet there's some of the best slapstick comedians out there. I know. But Naked Gun was great. And I was I was actually thinking of getting all the clips of Norberg out of the Naked Guns and throwing that in for an intro. Just because I have a twisted sense of humor and, and since the juice is gone. I was going to get all the Norberg stuff and wanted to put it. But then again, I didn't want YouTube to get off my case. Go to do anything interesting and they automatically shut me down. Pittsburgh, Heathers. How could you not like Heather? You had Heather, 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 Veronica. Right? I mean... I was a good movie, and that was, I mean, and you had two at the time, big stars there, right? Heathers was great. That's where people don't understand. They're like, oh, Gen X is the Karen generation where the women, they act this way and they be that way and they're pompous and think everyone should get out of the way and they're better amounts. No, it's not a Karen, it's a Heather. We know that because he watched Heathers. I <laughs> uh, see Robert breaks it down to its simplest form hot chicks what could be wrong with that well you know a little a little different misery oh misery 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 that movie caused me hassle in the theater Big time. Greetings, Pittsburgh. M misery caused me major problems in the theater because I remember we we're in the theater and we we're watching it. And I remember when he's fighting her to get away and he's got that little like elephant statue thing and he like bashes her in the head and she falls down on him. And I don't know what come over me, but I jumped up in the middle of the theater and screamed, hit her again, the bitch ain't dead. And I think I just busted the movie for everybody else because it was the whole theater just started laughing at me and turned around to see who it was talking. I got caught right up in it like crazy. It was got caught up in the movie moment and jumped up yelling at the screen in the theater because I, you know, 
I knew she wasn't dead. But you got to have that. Oh, oh. Jay, you're throwing them out there like crazy. Revenge of the Nerds and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. They were also excellent movies. They, they made so many of them nerds movies after a while because there was Revenge of the Nerds, Revenge of the Nerds 2. There was, what, Nerds in Paradise. Uh, and all that stuff. Well, it, Kathy, Kathy, having nightmares about Kathy Bates is a normal thing because she plays a sadistic, crazed psycho so well. She's done it in so many movies. She's always played this crazy, psycho woman. Hmm, excuse me. And she does it so well. That there's nothing you can do about it. You know, it's there. It's done. She's completely nuts. Now, Little Shop of Horrors. That's, that one gets interesting. I've watched it. I enjoy it as a, as a cult movie. It's not overly fascinating for me. Mommy Dearest. Mmm. Okay, Jay, who was the bully in the Karate Kid? Have Have you seen Have you seen it where they show it from the two sides and there's an argument to say that Daniel was the actual bully and the instigator? I mean, he started every fight. But like, no, they did first. I'm like, well, no, Daniel ran his mouth. So. There, there's an argument. You got to wonder who the bully is. You know. As they normally do, Robert, the first one is awesome and the rest slowly go downhill. And the same thing like, you know, Bill, Bill and Ted is, is great, you know. And we, we didn't have, when Bill and Ted came out, we never had a Circle K where I was. So the first time after the movie came out and we went past one, I had to run over in front of it and go, strange things are afoot at the Circle K. Like, absolutely. I had to do it that way. It had to be done that way. I had to enjoy myself. The Police Academy is something completely different on its own. You can almost say it was kind of in the style of, like, Leslie Nielsen and all that stuff. Oh, I don't know. They made too many of them as well. They they pushed with them too far, but that would be typical movie studio. If something works and they got the formula and they know it's going to make some money, they turn around and make some money. Absolutely. But... I, I think they are. I think the stream streaming services are going down in revenue because they've now oversaturated the market and there's only so many people going around and not everybody's going to sign up for every streaming service. Ronald, that is a good way to look at it, that the senseis were the actual bullies. You know, nope, there will never be. I know they are looking at doing a labyrinth and they've talked about it and they said the one thing they will not have in the labyrinth is they will not have a Goblin King at all because they will not try and replace Bowie. And the Dark Crystal was something, man. The Skeksis were, oh, you watch that when you're young and you see them tearing all the clothes off the other one and then he's all like, just his bone and everything sticking out everywhere through the rags. It's kind of creepy. You know. 
Well, that goes without saying, Robert, but I'm glad you said it because, yeah, they will screw it up. Absolutely. They're going to have to screw it up, you know, because they have to. Gleaming the Cube. I've been seeing a lot of people bring that movie up lately. And I don't know what it is. It says something about it that it's coming around. All of a sudden, Gleaming the Cube is following and showing up in the in the mainstream of everybody's psyche and is being talked about a lot of places. I, I see it mentioned all the time. And now the Money Pit, oh, Money Pit was good as well. I was never really a uh, a Tom fan, but it was a decent movie. I didn't mind it. Man, Disney is... What's the standard Disney thing? They got too big for their britches. Right? The, the, the mouse thought he was untouchable. Well, they finally built a bigger trap. The fifth column of franchises. <laughs> Might not be for as long if they keep losing money, they're going to have to sell. I mean... Uh, you, you know they're losing a lot now. The fact that they no longer have any, uh, they no longer have copyrights to actual Ma, uh, to Mickey, right? I mean, that went public domain here uh, a few months back. They had it for the hundred years or whatever, and now it's a uh, anybody can use Mickey's likeness. So they're going to lose money on that one. Because Disney has always been big on strong-arming people for anything they can if anybody tried to sell anything that remotely resembled Mickey or anything they had. You know what I thought was a good movie that I liked that they ended up making the TV series? And that was Alien Nation. I don't know a lot of people that ever actually watched that. Yeah, you know, Alien Nation, when the, the spaceship of the alien slaves crash on Earth and they end up folding them into society and they give them Earth names and they, uh, they, they can't go near salt water because it's like battery acid to them. And they get drunk on sour milk, which is an odd thing to throw in there, but... It's essentially a buddy cop show where it's a human and, and an alien detective. And I thought it was a good show. I thought it was a good movie. <laughs> the same head shape as the aliens from Alien Nation. You don't say that. That is good. And I have to agree with Robert. Disney has killed Star Wars. They ruined it. They absolutely destroyed it. Which is a shame. Even with the spots. Oh, come on. Yeah, Disney was syndicated. I mean, remember Sunday nights? Dis the Disney hour? They would have cartoons or they would show half a movie and then the, you'd have the one the next year, next week, right? The other half. Yeah, you had that Disney hour that everybody would watch after supper on Sunday. A platoon or full metal jacket. I'd have to say platoon is a better movie. I think the reason Full Metal Jacket, everybody likes it, is because of Sergeant Hartman, right? Uh, what was his real name again? He was only hired on to, uh, make, he was hired on to make sure that they kept it accurate and, and real. He was just there to, you know, give advice. And then he wound up getting the role because the other guy couldn't hack it. 
but I have to go with Platoon. Aquarium, I, I see to answer that about the Beverly Hills Cop coming out. I have high hopes, and I, I just hope I haven't gotten my hopes too high because a lot of these comebacks when they redo them just didn't work. Thank you, Jason. R. Lee Emery. Thank you for that. It, it was a shame that I uh, couldn't remember his name. He was great. In fact, he was in one of my favorite sci-fi TV shows, but didn't last very long. Uh, Space Above and Beyond. Uh, with the uh, wild card Space Marines. <laughs> he He worked at their boot camp. It was great. I've heard nothing good about the new Roadhouse. A uh, buddy of mine was watching it and he messaged me and he said, I'm 20 minutes in and it's a good movie. And then he messaged me five minutes later and he's like, ah, oh, scratch that. It just went to shit. So, I mean, in the first one wasn't much of a movie, right? It was just a standard basic fight movie. But then when you take a movie and you make it about a guy going to be a bouncer in a saloon and you name it Roadhouse, there's going to be expectation that it is at least going to be similarly close to the one that preceded it. I think they just named it that because I think that they figured they would get everybody in to watch it. And it's not anywhere, anything to do. I mean, you got essentially a bum living in his car who agrees to be a bouncer. It's just not that good. Where the other one, he was a professional bouncer. It was his absolute, it was his career always. You know, Yeah, that that was the thing. See, Jay Stevens, your niece and nephew just watched Weird Science and Beetlejuice for the first time. Oh, those are two great classics of our time. Inner Space. Here's to the man that saved my ass by injecting me into yours. Inner space was great. I I don't know many people that actually know the movie. I, I have inner space to go with it. The Three Amigos was all right. That was kind of fun. Oh, you know. And and yeah, the first Roadhouse was a good movie. It was it was done proper. It was the way it was supposed to be. And you can never go wrong having Sam Elliott in any type of movie playing the old gruff guy, whether he's in a western or playing a bouncer in a bar movie. Right. That, that's uh y you can't go wrong with any of that. Boingo boingo. Gosh. Now why 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 is that I'm drawing a blank, but at the same time I know I shouldn't. Over the top. That's another one. I don't know many people that know that movie. A whole movie about arm wrestling. A trucker dad who wants to arm all the truckers arm wrestle. And what is it? The grand prize is a new rig. That's all he wants is to win a new rig. So he works for himself and not for somebody else. And takes his sign traveling with him. You know, that that's kind of makes me think of uh, the similar story would have been real steel. For a modern type movie. You, you know. You, you had the truckers. And they were arm wrestling. And the main prize was a brand new rig. That everybody wanted. You know it was. That was a good movie. And I remember specific, specifically. When I saw Over the Top the first time. I was at my friend's house. And his parents would not watch. Any of the montage scenes. So like when they started driving down the highway. They would literally. They would fast forward. They had VCR with them wrote to fast forward and they would skip out anything where music played or driving scenes even back then. So you end up losing a bunch of the movie and you'd watch it in fast forward. Hmm. 
Rain Man was a, is in a category of its own, I think. Uh, Dustin Hoffman was just absolutely phenomenal in that movie. He nailed every aspect of it completely, 100%. There, he, he made no mistakes. He had it all right. And, and it was phenomenal for it. And I, I imagine if they went to do something like Rain Man now, they would, the person that went to do it would be completely lambasted and called all sorts of names. You know, well, Robert, he did. And, 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 he, and he nailed it. Like it was done so well. And, and yet, but if it, they went to do it now, um, you know, even if they went to air it on TV now, I'm sure there were people that would be trying to have it stopped because they didn't have somebody with that actual form of autism playing the role. So it shouldn't be on TV anymore because, you know, only blind people can play blind people and only deaf people can play deaf people. And that, that's the way they went with the movie. I mean, they did that with that movie with uh, Brian Cranston recently where he played the quadriplegic in the wheelchair. Right. And they, they got all pissy about it because they think they should have had a real quadriplegic play it. Well, if they want to know what it takes in order to have somebody in that condition actually be in a movie, they should go and look at everything they had to go through to have Christopher Reeves show up in the Smallville series for that time he did. It took months of logistical work to get it together and the doctors and everybody that had to be there for him to be able to be there to do that. So you, there's no way you'd be able to do an entire movie. And to top it off, the only reason they went through all that then is because that was Christopher Reeves. I mean, that was Superman. You know. Ronald, I loved how they took the Highlander movies and they blended the series and they ended it with the big movie that combined them both and brought them together in full circle. Now, I'm very afraid of the fact that they are remaking Highlander. And I think they are going to screw it up. I mean, one of the first worst things they ever did with Highlander was when they made, what was it? Highlander 2. Wasn't it 2 when they talked and it was the, they did it that they were aliens from another planet and not people that were born and turned immortal. And the thing with the, the, in the Highlander movies, they only came back immortal like that if they died violently. And of course, you could only be killed if you were decapitated, which is all right. Those that like Highlander was an epically great movie and the series was good. And then when they had the final movie that brought them both together and, you know, you had both the McClouds and you had them fight and he didn't want to kill him, but he had to, if he was ordered to beat the other guy. Because there can only be one. Ah, the triple Lindy. Or the triple Lundy. The, the greatest dive in diving history. You gotta love back to school. Because as much as it was a comedy, they put some reality in there. Like when he was in the economics class and they're telling him about we're going to build a building. And he's like, well, why would you build when you can rent for this? And... And if you're going to build that building, you're going to have things in it like concrete and that. And I don't know if you know who controls that, but then you got to have money for the bribes and the kickbacks. You had a little bit of honesty in a funny, straight up comedy movie. And then, and that was great. I mean, Back to School was a good movie. That was funny. I mean, how could you not like Rodney Dangerfield? I mean, he was, he was fantastic with everything. There's another funny man. The, he was right up there. He was one of the kings of the one-liners. You know, uh, what's his name was the other one. I can't remember. Oh, Chucky Norse, Chucky Norse. Chuck Norse in all his movies. 
90% of Chuck's Norse movies revolved around Vietnam. Strange brew, you know, you, you can't make movies where people are messing with the beer supply. That is just wrong. That that should not be allowed. It's untouchable. They should not allow to do those things. But Strange Brew is a fun movie. I mean, come on. Who doesn't paint their black lab up to look like a skunk? Right? I mean, come on. You want you want to do that? You paint your dog, your black lab to look like a skunk. And then name him Hosehead. Strange Brew is right up there. Did you know, Robert, that they originally were making a sequel to Strange Brew? In fact, they filmed almost three quarters of it before they ran out of money. And then they decided they weren't going to finance it anymore because it was becoming too expensive. I've always wanted to know how that was going to turn out. Absolutely. Coo, 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 coo. Remember, release moths in the movie theater. Stick a mouse in that beer bottle. You betcha. Do you have their Christmas album? <laughs> they they released a Christmas album. With, with all their songs on it. I think it's actually on a regular full album. Yeah. I kind of figured you did. That's that's classic stuff right there. That's great. That's... Uh... <laughs> yeah, you betcha. No, and there never could be, Jay, because... It was the first of its kind like that. It would it would never be again. I mean, of, of the first video that was like a mini movie. You know. It's, uh, that, that's what you got to do. But, it would never be. There'd never be another one. They'll they'll try. They'll make try and make things like that again. I mean, you know the original music videos were weren't much, and then I mean he he took the idea of the music video and cranked that up to a thousand. And then music videos had to be more than just camera shots of bands playing their songs different places. Right. Robert, I think at one time almost everybody owned an MJ, owned the Thriller album. I, I think they said at one time in 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 the U.S. at one time at the height of the sales of the album that it was something like one in twelve people had a copy of Thriller. It was absolutely insane. Nobody outsold the Thriller album ever until uh, Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill album came out. She's the only one to truly dethrone the Thriller album. And that was the only thing she ever made that was any good. I mean, she toured for like three, four years straight off her Jagged Little Pill. It was insane. And then she was basically burnt out and hasn't done anything worth listening to since. But. <laughs> they still do yearly like zombie dances. I, I see them places now and then. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Soundtracks aren't the same now. When you buy like a soundtrack now, it, it's it's all the orchestra background music where when you had a the soundtrack to the movies when we were they either if they didn't use somebody else's music, they actually had artists write the songs for the movie. You know, um like in Young Guns. It was the Young Guns or, or Young Guns 2 when uh, Bon Jovi wrote the, the album, 
right? The soundtrack album. Well, he sat down and he wrote all the songs for that movie. They were specifically written for the movie. They weren't just a bunch of, you know, instrumental orchestra music in the background that they play now for soundtracks. Soundtracks just aren't great anymore. You know, that was... Oh, yeah, he's a tiny little man. <laughs> okay, yeah, it was part two. Well, it's, I think he was still in the band and when the first one came out. Then the band broke up, and then he was on his own when he did the soundtrack for number two. See? Tom Cruise is the reason I didn't like the Jack Reacher movies when they made them because you don't get a guy that's five foot six to play a guy that's six foot six and like 260 pounds. Yes, Robert, you do. The New Mexico Territory. Really, Pittsburgh? That would have been kind of something. <laughs> Days of Thunder was good. Cole Trickle. Nobody liked Cole Trickle. They're doing, he's doing a sequel to that as well. I think what it is, is when he decided to do the sequel of that, is he saw how, how well Top Gun Maverick did that he decided that he's going to do a Days of Thunder too. You know, so they're they're sitting there and they're doing a second Days of Thunder, and we'll see if they do it right. I mean, they did the second Top Gun right. It was nothing but a homage paid to the original and to the fans of the original that would come and watch it, and that's what you're supposed to do when you remake these types of movies. You make them for the people that enjoyed and enjoyed and loved the first one and are going to go because we're going to drag along our kids or grandkids with us to watch it. You were saying that, Robert, before. Part of, now it's part of the UFO Museum today. That is something. You know, ha ha. Never ending story. That movie gave so many kids the, a major traumatic moment when you watch the horse go down in the quicksand. And yes, The Great Outdoors was a good movie. It was a great movie. I mean, come on, John Candy. He, he, he made epic movies. You know, The Bear Bust Through. Eats that 96-ounce steak. Right? I mean, uh, that's an excellent movie as well. And I remember all the jokes of the never ending story that people were going to sue because they called it the never ending story and they over and ever made two of them or whatever it was. You know, the nothing. Only in our time would they make the big, bad, epic bad guy something that is just nothing. You know. Oh. Pittsburgh, I think you're going to have to break that down to which album of theirs. Because depending on which Zeppelin album you pick, you could say they almost were best than anything else. Their best first album, as in their first one. Uh-huh. Could be. Yeah, and the planes, trains, and automobiles. Again, John Candy. Just too damn good. Uh, I've always wanted to know. 
sitting here. Since you live in the area, Robert, and you've lived around there and your family lived around there, does anybody ever talk, what is the local consensus? Did Garrett shoot Billy the Kid or not? What do people, what do people from the area who like live there and their families live there believe happened? Do they believe that Billy got away? That Garrett didn't actually kill him? Because there was what's his name that came forward in around 51 or 52 or something claiming that uh, he was him. So, but they always have them stories, right? I mean, they tried to say that Billy the Kid got away. They tried to say that Jesse James actually wasn't killed. Um, what? There were sightings of Butch Cassidy long after they were supposedly gunned down there in... Uh, oh, shit. Wherever it was there, Peru, right? I think they were in Peru. Like they... Every one of them, there's always a legend that one of them, somebody survived. Besides, I don't think they have to sit there and spread things when it comes to the Jesse James one. I don't think you'd ever have to spread and try and say Jesse James was alive. The fact that like Cole Younger was shot as many times as he was and survived and then went on to ride in the Wild West show. And that uh, Frank James went on, what? He went on to win a seat in Congress, didn't he? So, really, that is crazy. I could see them doing a thing there every year. I mean, who who wouldn't they capitalize on that, right? You'd be crazy not to latch on to that history. Although I'm sure at some time they're going to turn around and want to not have people getting on it anymore. Well, let's see. Robert Redford or Paul Newman. Probably have to go Paul Newman. Uh, that would be my call. Oh, it is a super tiny town. Still sitting there, not much bigger than it was then. Uh, but that begs the question, what is a tiny town in New Mexico? I mean, I've seen towns that are listed as towns that have literally had five houses and only and one street left, and yet people live in them, and it's still a town, and they look after their own stuff and still have a street light and... Exactly like it was then. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> that is crazy. Ye See, there, I always find that there's something special about living somewhere where there has that kind of iconic history to it that everybody knows. Yeah, there had, just has to be a kind of a little different feeling being around there. You, you know, like, it can be hard to explain. I know... Uh, when my cousin was uh, riding bulls professionally and we'd travel and see things, there was a feeling in the arenas before the crowd came in because you knew what was going to take place and what had taken place the day before. And it has to feel that way. Yeah, see, and it has to 
kind of be that way when you get to go to or live in that sort of very significant historical site. And so, <laughs> let's see, to do, to do. Yes, oh, Mr. Orson Welles. That man was something else. Orson Welles and Vincent Price. Two very special people in their world. Actually, I think you also have to add, uh, oh, what's his name into it there? Oh, crap. Why can't I remember now? Hitchcock, Alfred Hitchcock, Orson Welles, Alfred Hitchcock, and Vincent Price. Those three are their own category of special entertainers, I would say. You know, Orson was an amazing storyteller. I mean, he was great. And, and Vincent Price was the same thing. You, you hear both of them talk or even just telling a story in just the voice, and it always came across as this, this wild, eventful thing that you just had to, you know. Nick. Nick, 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 everybody, let's hear it for Nick, 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 Nick. There you go, buddy. Welcome. But yeah, it's there, <laughs> right up there. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it did. The, the War of the Worlds was awesome. <laughs> I, I love when they replay that every Halloween they play when he did that whole uh, War of the Worlds radio play. And then the simple fact is, if you did not hear and tuned in after his two minutes telling you that what he was going to do was a play and a story and a one-man show, essentially, you would not have known that it wasn't real. Because the whole thing was played up as being, he was there, actual news reports, you know. Well, and Paul Harvey. Yes, you can't, can't forget Paul Harvey, absolutely. Excuse me. See who? Spike Johns. Ha ha. Paul Harvey does rule. Vincent Price is great. I, I loved it when uh, Cooper had him on the Black Widow album and doing the voiceover for, for the Black Widow song. I like get was... He's an amazing man. Oh, well, look at that. Subscription time. Welcome. That's always nice to see when somebody pops by and says hello by pushing that button. You you mean with the whole Orson Welles thing? I don't know about the people jump out of buildings, but in the rural areas, there were people gathering up and getting their uh, getting their guns together and going off to go fight the alien invasion. You know, so that was uh, quite something. Yes. We had Madam Karen subscribe. Bingo, bango. Absolutely. It's always nice to see. 
pop up. Kading. I had a couple of them periodically on the live show. If aliens show up, you're stealing their ship. I don't think aliens would ever come here because any group of talent of alien races who could absolutely make it this far from wherever they were would have more than enough sense to even pay us any mind. They would probably look down at us and be like, yeah, no, they're the backwoods redneck planet of the galaxy. Stay away from there. It is nothing but trailer parks and tornadoes. Not really. That, I, they, I wouldn't see them ever coming by and stopping. Like, why? What would what would be the point? Seriously, if you were a super advanced high tech alien race and you came by and saw this planet, would you ever sit in there want to be around? No. Ah, Robert, you couldn't resist. She spelled it with a Y, though. No E. <laughs> right, Jay? Yeah, yeah. This is what a bag of potato chips costs. Absolutely. They wouldn't They wouldn't deal with it. They'd be gone. They, they couldn't. I mean, come on. We got to be like the out-of-control daycare planet. Right. I mean, if you think about it, anybody who is capable of traveling anywhere, any race and to come by here at the very least, the very least minimum is probably looking at more than a hundred thousand or a hundred thousand years more advanced than we are, unless we are just missing some exponential leap in technology that we just haven't discovered yet. And you actually advance faster than you could think. But uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Nick. We're the dive bar planet. We're, we're the dirt floor. I'd have to go with Duran Duran because, you know, you get hungry. And sometimes you're just hungry like a wolf. And yeah, I had to do it. I had to say it. I couldn't let that one slide. Not at all. Well, we'll cut you some slack, Robert. You, you, when you go to a birthday party of someone that you have known virtually almost every day of your life, you deserve to have a few beers and be a little drunk and a little stoned and enjoying yourself. Why not? Ah, they did. They did. Music before auto-tune. See, Nick, everybody says that, but everybody ta is, takes it the wrong way. I mean, if I take a car and I go out and I say, I'm going to drive it like I stole it, I'm going to drive very nicely because I'm in a stolen car. And I don't want to get pulled over and get arrested and shot and locked up for the next five to 10. So you don't drive it like you stole it. You drive it like it's the last ride you're ever going to take. Like my, my, my old man, my dad, man, that, that old, uh, old son of a bitch. When he, when he was gone, going and he sat there and it was, it was his last night. We knew he was gone that night and he was, he was still loose. And I went to talk to him and I went in to go see him and I'm just like, God, ah, he looks at me and he's like, don't look good, son. Oh, but God damn, it's been a hell of a ride. And I'm like, you couldn't have any better last conversation with your old man than that, where he was, you know, he wasn't worried. He he took a ride. He had a hell of a ride through life. <laughs> you know, Bamo. You, you gotta. Eighties music and grunge. Yeah. 80s music got funky. You got when you, especially when you got all that electronic synth and stuff in there that went a little far, right? 
Thank God for heavy metal and hard rock. I wouldn't have made it. No way. You know, I would sit there and I would listen to Priest and Maiden and Megadeth. You know, those those were my my favorites. Of course, yeah, a lot of Alice Cooper. You know, Skid Row, Wasp, the the harder stuff. I wasn't so much into the. You know, I enjoyed Poison. Even had some of their albums. I wasn't so much into the makeup. And I get mad. I tell you, I got it. You got to Every one of us should carry around pictures of all the different album covers of the hair bands of the day. When people tell me that I have to, I can't be a certain way because we didn't have that in our time. I didn't understand. And then we pull out all these albums where you can't literally tell on the album half the time if that is a male band or a female band because they all look the same. Damn right. Who couldn't be in the Prince? Prince Prince is on a level of his own. Completely on his own. He 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 was he he was a he he was a level of artist I don't think like you'll ever see. Prince was just something completely different. I mean, he played every instrument imaginable. He wrote all his songs, all his music, and to find out after he died that the rumors about the vault of hundreds and hundreds of finished polished songs that were never published because he used to say the music's in there. He has to just get it out. So he, you know, I imagine coming up at some point, they're going to start releasing Prince albums or, or dumping them out for on, on streaming services and stuff like it's crazy. Yeah. You know, he, he was in a class of his own. And Metallica, Metallica, yeah, Metallica was good up until, what, uh, Black Album? They kind of bit the dust with that load and reload. I didn't like them. And I think they, they kind of won themselves back as far as I was concerned with St. Anger. But I was always more of a Megadeth fan. Y- you know. Which you have to look at because never has a band split ever worked better for somebody than when you know you you had that rift yeah Robert you're right they did (laughs) the Black Album was complete commercial fluff everybody said it at the time it was crazy um, you know, but then they tried doing, you know, Dave Mustaine as a genius invented the spider cord. But he, here's the thing. If it wasn't for the fact that Metallica, the original version of Metallica split, you wouldn't have had Metallica and Megadeth. You would have had just like, imagine if Dave Mustaine stayed with them. I don't think the band would have actually lasted They're way too big egos. Well, Aquarium, you want to hear what's weird about that? Because when that happened, here, here's how it goes. I hadn't spoke to my dad in a long time. Like we're talking a few years. And I was at work. I was living in the city that I was in and I was working and I got hurt at work. I had driven a knife through my hand at work. And so I had to go to the emergency room at like three in the morning to get stitched. And I didn't know it. But they had just transported my dad to that same hospital that day from his town where he lived. And that's how I found out we were, he was still in the, uh, getting admitted in into where he was going to be. And I was in the emergency room 
And the doctor that was admitting him into that hospital was the same one that came in to see me and saw that we had the same last name and came in at roughly the same time. And that's how I found out he was in the hospital. Honest to God, if I hadn't uh, actually messed up at work and drove, accidentally drove that knife through my hand, I probably wouldn't have known and I probably would not have been there. But I got to see him and I got to talk to him and it was, it was great. It wasn't, uh, it was just one of them things you, you get to have, if you're lucky, you get to have that moment. And I got lucky, very lucky. Oh, Pittsburgh Peace Cells. Peace Cells absolutely is. Great album. You know, it was great album. Yeah, Robert, we definitely are. We are definitely a different breed and a different generation. We, we, we look at things different. We absorb things different. Now you, now you see, yeah, Robert, not, not, not all of us, or Nick, not all of us get lucky for that moment then. Now, I don't know what your beliefs are, but, you know, every time, if you go to sleep and dream, you can stay, say, still say hello and goodbye then, you know, all that stuff. So, there, there's always a way and you'll always get a chance if you didn't get that chance in person, you just sit back one time by yourself and look inside. And it can be that way, Robert. I wouldn't say goodbye to my mother. In fact, if I heard she was on life support, I would fight them for the right to pull the goddamn plug. Completely different relationship between my dad and my mom. My mom is completely not psycho. In fact, she actually tried to have me killed once. So we don't get along. And I haven't seen her in, in years and have no inkling to ever have any contact with her whatsoever. My daughter's never seen her. My sister and brother don't see her, don't talk to her. It, it's so, I, I get where that one comes from, Robert. Because, uh, oh, it's just the way it is. She made a choice. See, she wasn't always that way. She, it, it's, that, it's that same old trope of a story, okay? Years ago, at work, she, she broke her back and she had two surgeries to repair it that didn't repair it. She was in constant pain for her whole life. And of course, then they start with the, the, the pills and the medication and the painkillers and it turns to this and it turns to that. And then she straight out said she'd rather be high and on the street than get off the drugs and have a family. So I know what city she's in, but we have no, no contact with her whatsoever. You know, that's just one of them things. It happens. I didn't really take it a whole lot too personal. Um, you know, it's it's just one of them things. You, you get by. You, you move along. You get some goddamn tough skin and a slightly scarred soul. But you grow up. You bond with your siblings a little more than you would have otherwise. You uh, you make darn well that you definitely ain't going to be that way. Like me, I don't even take an aspirin. I have to be into the point of pain where I'm going to pass out before I take anything. In fact, this finger right here 
I had stitched back on. It was I cut it right through the bone. It was dangling, and I never let them freeze it or anything, and they stitched it back. Now, absolutely the most painful thing I felt in my life, I passed out and tipped over. You know, so <laughs> I did not make a sound. I started getting dizzy and I looked at him and I said, I think I'm going to pass out now. And I started to tip over out of the chair because I was just sitting there with my hand on the tray while he was stitching my finger back up. And then a nurse came and quickly sat down <laughs> and leaned me and held me. And when he was done, I kind of came to again. <laughs> And they, and they didn't have it. I mean, so when I fell on the sheet metal and went through this wrist and had to get it all stitched back together, you damn right, I took the painkillers on that one. All kinds of lives, all types of relationships. You grow, you learn. And you don't make the same damn errors that they did. Mm. Ah, see? Well, my dad wouldn't have done that. I do remember once, uh, my, my old man, when I was about, I think about nine, gave me a licking. And I, and I thought I had gotten pretty tough and he gave me this licking and I sat there and I'm like, Hey, that didn't hurt. And he just got up, went downstairs and I could hear him chopping. Cause we had a wood stove and he'd keep some wood in the house and he chopped the wood and I could hear him chopping and he came back up and he had took one of the logs and he split them out a piece about 18 inches long <laughs> and probably about a half inch diameter and gave me another one. <laughs> And after that, I never, ever, ever, if I got a lick and said, that did not hurt. I, I got three whoopings growing up, and that was it, and they were all deserved. They were all well-earned. And even looking back on it, I've never considered it that they were a beating or an abuse. They were well-earned. Two were from my dad, and one was from my grandfather. So... I, and then they were completely, completely well earned. And it was the one from my grandfather that stuck with me more than anything else in the world. All right. So here's the licking that my grandfather gave me. My dad was long haul truck driver and was gone for months at a time, literally. So I was, I would stay with my grandparents when he was on the road. And what, it, what had happened? is we were going to town and we only went to town once a week. Sometimes we didn't go until every two weeks. And we were going to go to town. It was a big to-do. We dressed up, go, go to town. I can't remember exactly what I was doing, but I was being a little snot in the car. And my grandma was telling me to smarten up and behave or we were going to turn around and we were going to go home. And we weren't going to go to town until the following week. And she, and she said this just as we were rolling into town, the restaurant that we had lunch at every day before, or every time we went to town before we left was there, like we we're pulling in. And I remember that she said, we'll turn this car around and go home. And all I said was, yeah, right. We're already here. And my grandfather never said a word. He pulled the car over, got out, pulled me out of the back seat. Hand my bare ass on the side of the road in front of everybody driving by, placed me back into the car, shut the door, got in, did a U-turn, and drove us straight home. And we did not go to town until the next week. It did not get brought up. It got nothing. We we ended up with, we didn't have milk the last few days, so I couldn't have the cereal. We You know, it was, that was the punishment. And that one stuck with me. And it was more because it wasn't because of the not going to town or anything. It was the fact that my grandfather was all business the entire drive in. He never said a word. It was grandma doing the talking. But when it came time, when it came time to whoop ass, he did it. And he did it calmly. And he did it with no expression on his face whatsoever. And that, that stuck with me my whole life. 
I think about it lots and I meet people and I talk about that story and I mention it all the time. It, it is quite, quite the thing. Now, you, you know, Nick, I'm going to say when I, I see this, a, a, a lot of us ended up not being that way, didn't lay hands because we, I think that was part of the problem we had with what happened with us, with uh, our, our own kids is a part of it is I think with the crap that we had and the crap that we dealt with and the, and the being left alone and almost feeling abandoned crap when we were young all the time, we made sure we were busting that shit. We weren't running that same cycle. We weren't going to be that way. Cause yeah, it, it toppened us up. It made us who we are, but at the same time, and we talk about how other people, other kids, the younger generation, they need to toughen up. But at the same time, do we really want them going through what we went through? Right? I mean, I mean, how many people? Because my parents, well, my dad was, uh, my dad was silent, Jen. My mother was a boomer. Okay. They had like uh, 15 years between them. So, and, and, and then like, it, it was completely different. My dad was quiet. My grandfather never said two words when I stayed with him. I think all I ever heard him usually say was, yeah, as he was breathing in. I don't even know if that registered in the microphone, you know, but we, we didn't, I just, I don't do that. My, my sister too. Well, it wasn't about uh, spanking the kids. She took a different route. The kids got overly misbehaved. They had to do hard work. She kind of went. She kind of went the Soviet Union way. I sentenced you to hard labor, you know. <laughs> but my nieces are fabulous. They're 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 amazing girls. They're 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 so independent. And they they speak their minds so well. Like she she taught them to think for themselves and speak up. And they do, and it does cause problems, especially with other adults that they, that sit there and think they should be able to steamroll over kids, any kids, even though they don't know them. You know. But it was. You have to make that choice, like Nick Robert. You know, you you make that choice that you were. You are breaking that. You are not going to let that happen. This is not the way it's going to be. You know, but my, my, my dad, grandparents and stuff, they were never about, um, really about the whole physical discipline thing. That was a very, that was a rare thing. Like, like I said, the two that I got from my dad, one was because I, I drew down on him with my bow. And so that was well-deserved. And the other one was, I was playing hockey one time and I kicked, tried to kick a kid in the crotch with my hockey skates. And I got one then too. And then there was the one my grandfather gave me. So the ones I got there were well, well-deserved. My mother's second husband, on the other hand, that's a completely different story. You know, Absolutely. It's like, yeah, I pointed out that uh, discipline is about learning, not about punishment. There, there's huge difference. And then people tend to forget that because there's all sorts of forms of, of discipline and they all teach you to learn something. Discipline is something you learn and learn from. Punishment is just punishment there's a whole idea where people would be like the dumbest thing in the world is to teach your kids not to hit is to hit them and say don't hit people right i mean you remember that i remember them talking about that when we we're kids it took a little later it was the later gen x kids but oh my ear is itchy it took a little later but uh the later Gen X kids, you know, they were teaching us that, you know, 
people don't have the right to beat on you. And you had to learn. That'll do it. <laughs> there you go, Robert. Mm. That's how that goes, right? Absolutely. Deal with it. I'm done with it. Clearly. Hey, yeah, Nick. F around and find out on the streets, I'll tell you. But when you talk about that, I shared a story today that uh, was an event that happened in my life that I thought, I thought it was, I thought my life was over. I, I was telling the, the woman today about it. And it was even a story that she's never known after all these years. And I had to make a choice in life. Continue that way and, or not continue that way. And I chose no. Hmm. But let's just say I, I thought it was the end of days because it ended with me being driven away in the back of a van. It's horrible. I, I thought I thought I was done. I'd crossed a line I didn't know I crossed. And then I wasn't going to abandon somebody, a friend of mine who was in some serious trouble. And I thought it was going to end badly. It's a story I might share. If, if I do, that'll be for next week. I don't know about always sharing all these things on, on here. You never know who watches this stuff sometimes. So I actually get quite a few people that watch after it's posted. But we did, we we did have some hair. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll save that one for next week. It's uh, I I went through it once, and it's um, even kind of weirds me out still now. You see, Aquarium, that, that is a thing. It's not a surprise, right? It, it, it is sad, and it's like, man. But at the same time, you look at it and you go, that was, that was our reality. And then, you, and then you read these all these years later and go, I wasn't the only one. Sometimes it felt like it was just me, but it wasn't just me. I wasn't the only one. It gets to be that way sometimes. It's a tough one. I've always said we are probably the generation that has the most scars that anybody knows of. I mean, we are the generation with the highest rate of alcohol and, and drug abuse for self-medicating, right? Like, it, that's a simple fact. And a lot of that has to be with the way we grew up. And Robert, like you said, I, I tell people I wouldn't actually change a thing. Now, years later, I wouldn't change a thing because all that crap, all that shit, as crazy as it was, as hairy as it was, I wouldn't change a thing. I'd go through it again. I, I'd go through it all again. Because it got me where I am today. Exactly, Robert. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, one bourbon, one scotch, one beer. No, it did. It made us who we are today. Oh... Well, well, let's see. I know. Oh, yeah, I, I can't. It's it's too too late to get into that one. I will share that little story next Saturday. 
because when I get going on that one, I'll probably go for a while. So I will, uh, I'll do that one next Saturday, absolutely. I'll share that story because it's kind of wild. I thought I wasn't going home. <laughs> I, I, I honestly, honest to God, thought I was taking the last ride of my life that day. We're into the George Thorogood and absolutely. You got to have your skirt, your bourbon, your scotch, your beer. Merle Haggard was great as well. But um, other one I like. <laughs> so am I, so am I. Aquarium, most scars and most physical and emotional damage. Now, anybody who has served, I do not want to put this the wrong way. But except for military personnel who have actually been in an active theater, Generation X probably is the most emotionally scarred and, gener and people with like PTSD and stuff like that. The only ones that would have that would have more and worse would be those that have served and been off in an active theater and seen even shit that we haven't seen. I, I always say that and I try to not say it. in a way that would uh, offend anybody that has served because I've always admired people that stand up and go do that. I never did. They rejected me. <laughs> I, I, I tried. I wasn't allowed. Yep. Oh. You can't care about them after a while. They be they become like a badge of honor after a while, the scars, right? You, you can't do a scar contest and show off the emotional ones, but you do a scar contest and show off the physical ones. Yes, Nick, every generation does go through a little something that is unique to them. I will give them credit for that. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of the problems was, though, is we just weren't paid attention to. They didn't have real safety concerns about kids or anything like that. We were just kind of like something that happened to our parents during their lives that just kind of got in the way of them living their lives. That's, that's how it felt sometimes. It was grandiose. It was wild. It was fun. And like Robert said, and most of us agree would not change a thing because it has made us who we are. Yeah, see, Robert, that, that's the type of thing I'm talking about right there. <laughs> yeah, the neglected free-range generation. Absolutely. Wild to the core. Which surprises me when we let as much crap go on that we do now. But we become so pessimistic about shit. We're just kind of like, ah, they're not really in our way. They're not really bothering me today. But if they're bothering me tomorrow, I'm going to knock them on their ass. Right? I mean, that's how it is. Don't come busting through my front door uninvited. Mm. There you go. Well, not to say I love where this is going and the steady conversation, but it's getting late. I'm getting tired. 
I tend to get up early. And I tend to wake up about 2 a.m. and not sleep, and then I'm up until about 4.30. Well, for most of them, Robert, all you got to do to be better armed than the cops for sure is to be able to think. I probably shouldn't have said that, but you know what? You know what I mean? I think over the years, they've lowered the standard for police a little too far. But it's been great. I've had a I've had another epic night. I've enjoyed this so much. The conversation. Everyone turns out. We share the memories. We share the good. We share the bad. You take the good. You take the bad. And there you have the facts of life. Yeah, I'm going to apologize for that. That was that was wrong. That was bad. <laughs> shouldn't have uh, <laughs> brought up the facts of life, you know. Tootie and Blair and Joe and, you know. But it's it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. I have thoroughly enjoyed. So, everybody, have a good night. I will see you next week. And I will be back again. Same time, most definitely. And absolutely. So good night, everyone, and remember, stay safe or as safe as you can because we're Gen X.